What are the top storylines for Tennessee football heading into the orange and white game coming up on Saturday? There are a few things we've been watching this entire spring practice period. Which ones will maybe come to fruition on Saturday? That Twitter Tuesday, a whole lot more here on your Tuesday. Locked on balls. You are locked on balls. Your daily podcast on the Tennessee volunteers. Part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into it. It's your Tuesday edition of Locked On Vols. I'm your host, Eric Kane. As always, so happy that you have elected to spend some of your morning, some of your uh, daytime here with me here on Locked On Vols. It's every single weekday morning uh, when you wake up. It's 30 minutes, maybe 31, 32 minutes, sometimes maybe 35 minutes. Try to keep it around 30 minutes each and every day to get you guys uh, for that commute to work each and every morning. Appreciate you guys subscribing to Locked On Balls on the YouTube channel and downloading it wherever you find your podcast, writing me five stars and all that good stuff. Got a fun show coming up here today. Top storylines entering the orange and white game coming up on Saturday. Going to have that conversation. Hit your mailbag questions in segment uh, two. And then in segment number three, I'm not sure if you watched the On the Clock series that debuted last night on ESPN2, and of course you can stream it at ESPN Plus as well. It's from Omaha Productions, where they kind of catch up with some of the top quarterbacks for this class of 2023, or yeah, class of 2023 draft class. Anyway, Hendon Hooker's episode was last night, so gonna going to touch a little bit on that coming up in segment number three. So what are those top storylines for Tennessee football entering the orange and white game? Well, again, a lot of this we've already kind of talked and rehashed. I mean, hell, we talked position battles for... You know, a little bit on yesterday's show. So obviously those are some of the top storylines. But for me, the top storyline entering the orange and white game, and this is very administrative, if you will. Um, I mean, sure, injuries are a part of the game, but in the grand scheme of things, that's not what you want your, one of your biggest takeaways to be uh, from spring practice. But one of my biggest storylines entering the orange and white game is who's going to be out there, who's going to be missing. And that's typical for, you know, orange and white games and for spring practices. You want to be overly cautious with some of your starters, and Tennessee has done that very, very much. Tennessee held out two linebackers from the scrimmage, uh, and Keenan Peely and Aaron Beasley, who could have likely played uh, if it was a game. This was last week, and Tennessee's been very cautious with uh, Jalen Wright, the running back this spring. Tennessee's been very cautious with Dante Thornton with a hamstring, with Romel Keaton, a wide receiver. Um, you know, and the list goes on and on and on, right? I mean, there's more than, you know, that I haven't even mentioned. Of course, there's been some guys who have been out all of spring because of offseason injuries and procedures, such as Jabari Small, Brew McCoy, Brandon Turnage on the defensive side of the football. Uh, Cooper Mays has been out here for a little bit, and, and it's such a minor injury, but I think if it was a game, he probably could have played. But it opens up the door for, again, Addison Nichols and, and, and Parker Ball and Bison Lane to, Really try to figure out who is going to be that number two center for Cooper Mays come fall. And so, you know, for me, it's injuries. Who's out there? Who's not? What wide receivers are going to be made available for uh, these these quarterbacks throwing the football on Saturday? That's been one. Who's who's where on the offensive line? Ollie Lane's been banged up here recently. Will he make his return? That, for me, is the biggest storyline because I want to see a, you know, we're all going to watch this picture, you know, on, on Saturday. And I want some good paints, some paintbrushes out there giving me this picture, if you will. And so, you know, I want to see some guys out there playing some football. So that, for me, is the biggest storyline. Now, my second biggest storyline, and this is likely probably your first, because it's, it's you know, sea ball, hit ball, and baseball, right? It's, you know, football, quarterbacks. How do the quarterbacks look? And, and that's not to diminish, you know, anybody that's thinking that way, because obviously it's the, as I said repeatedly, it's the most important position in all of sports, in my opinion, right? Uh, one of the hardest, it's, it's, the most important. And, and last time I said that, somebody chimed in somewhere in the comments or maybe DM me and said catcher might be the hardest. And I would agree. Catcher's probably, you know, lo- likely up there with cornerback, in my opinion. And and it's also most important because when you get to the big leagues, you're calling games as well. So anyway, back to what I'm saying, the quarterbacks. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think Joe Milton's had a fine spring. Um, you know, I think he's made some mistakes. Uh, but I think he's made a lot of plays. Um, I think he's struggled at times, but again, I think he's gone out there and, and looked great at times. I wouldn't say he's had a great spring, and I wouldn't say he's had a bad spring. I think he's you know been solid all spring long. I think Nico Imaliava has had some growing pains. I think he's made a lot of mistakes, and that's okay, right? I mean, Joey Halsley even said 
at the beginning of spring practice, you know, hey, I told Tim Banks, the defensive coordinator, bring it. Bring it on. Game on. We want to make mistakes right now because it is okay to make those mistakes in spring. And you can turn around and say, here's your mistake. This is why you made this mistake. And you learn from that, grow from that. So hopefully you don't make those same mistakes in fall camp and ultimately, you know, going into the season. So um, I think Nico's going through some growing pains. I do. And I also think Nico's flashed. I think Nico's made some nice throws and I think he's made some nice plays and I think he's grasping the offense at a good rate. I think he's, you know, the game is starting to slow a little bit down for him. I think he's getting better with the tempo. Uh, but again, Rome wasn't built in the day and he's had, you know, going on 11, you know, 12 practices in the Tennessee uniform, official practices. I don't really count the bowl practices. Really, again, the, the biggest need for those guys being here for the bowl practices is because that's essentially signing your national letter of intent. It means you don't have to keep recruiting them and you keep them from going somewhere else, you know, right up into the buzzer. That is what those bowl practices is for those guys. And sure, you get to be a part of the team and you get to don the jersey and you get to see what practice looks like and you get to you get introduced a little bit, but you're not taking any meaningful reps in team whatsoever. That's why, you know, that CBS Sports story from over the off season, like back in January or February, or maybe even March, is before spring practice started when Dennis Dodd kind of gave his 25 big things and one of those was, you know, Nico's a bust. I'm like <laughs> Dude hadn't taken a rep in team yet, you know? So that's just kind of, you know, my opinion on that. So what do the quarterbacks look like? Um, obviously, you know, we're going to have a lot to say about that come Saturday. So really looking forward to seeing Joe Milton and Nico Imaliava compete in the Orange and Wide game coming up on Saturday. Um, the other one would be position battles. We spoke on that a whole lot at nauseum yesterday. Offensive guard, offensive tackles, cornerbacks, safeties, some of that as well. And then... You know, the 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 last thing I'll say in terms of a storyline for me, how about these young running backs? Jabari Small, is, and we'll, we actually have a Twitter Tuesday question about this coming up in segment number two, but Jabari Small is out. He's not practicing this spring whatsoever, had surgery uh, over the offseason. Jalen Wright has been extremely limited, you know, making the joke that he's been putting bubble wrap all spring because, again, like what's – Sure, you want to get better. You can always get better and everything, but also you just don't want to take the chance of injuring one of your main guys in spring practice. You know, for what, right? And so he's been extremely limited. So that means there's been a whole lot of run, no pun intended, for Dylan Sampson, for Deshaun Bishop. Cam Seldon, you know, got back and, and started scrimmaging again this past week. And so that's been really, really good to see. And by all accounts, and what we've heard and from what Josh Heupel's heard, and what, you know, we, we've heard from some people that have been at all practices and these scrimmages and everything. Now, the young running backs are looking good. We know Dylan Sampson has been looking really, really good, but you know, Deshaun Bishop, you know, we kind of had a segment on who is Deshaun Bishop last week. And again, I'm not trying to um, amplify this. Like Deshaun Bishop will be a guy for Tennessee this fall, because I don't think that's going to happen. And again, that's no slight to Deshaun Bishop whatsoever. It's just, you know, look at the pecking order here, right? Tennessee's got Jabari Small, Jalen Rod, Dylan Sampson. Those are three right there. Cam Selden's going to get his opportunities because of, you know, who he is in this offense, right? And that doesn't mean that Deshaun Bishop won't have a role or won't have an opportunity in a blowout or anything like that, but it just means, hey, he's come in, he's learned the offense, he's adapting to the college game, the speed of the game, he's finishing runs well, and he's providing Tennessee with so much depth at that position that you feel really, really good about it. So, um, I want to know about the quarterbacks. I want to see these young running backs in action. Cam Selden, Deshaun Bishop, Dylan Sampson, right? Uh, we've seen a lot of Dylan Sampson as a true freshman, but he's kind of the old man in the room right now with uh, the, the true old men, the veterans, right, being sidelined and, and you know, for, for cautious reasons and everything. So I want to see these young running backs. I want to see the quarterbacks. I want to see who is out there uh, in terms of injury situations, if they're going to let Keenan Peely and Caleb Be and uh and Aaron Beasley and and Cooper Mays, I would assume not Cooper Mays, but uh, some of these other veterans get out there and play in the orange and white game. I'm intrigued to see that. And um, of course, those position battles, offensive tackle, offensive guard, uh, safety, cornerback, and uh, someone mentions here on Twitter Tuesday, we'll get to in a moment, tied in as well. So uh, really, really looking forward to the orange and white game. And those are my top storylines entering that exhibition game coming up on Saturday. Uh, really, really looking forward to that. All right, when we come back, we'll hit up your Twitter Tuesday questions, all part of the Mailbag Show 
uh, each and every Tuesday right here on Lockdown Balls. But hey, grand slams, no hitters, double plays, they're all back, right? And there's no better chance, no better place to get in on all that MLB action than at FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. That's because right now, new customers can step up to the plate with a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and sign up, place your first bet, and get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. You can pick the over or under and home runs total for the future bets for uh, you know Atlanta Braves slugger Ronald Acuna Jr. What about stolen bases totals on the season? Can Ronald get a 40-40 season? He was really, really close a couple years ago. It was a whole lot of fun to watch back in 2021. Uh, what about a pitcher such as... You know, Charlie Morton going over under the strikeout total in his next start. All that and more for the Atlanta Braves and any other of your favorite teams, but we're always going to talk Atlanta Braves here on this podcast on Lockdown Balls, am I right? Uh, but you can find all that at FanDuel Sportsbook. Don't miss your chance at a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome back into it. Locked on Balls, your Tuesday edition of the show. I am Eric Kane. You can always find me and send in those Twitter Tuesday mailback questions at underscore Kaner and at Locked on Balls. All right, uh, let's get to the mailback portion of today's show, and we will start by checking the YouTube comments, and we'll go to Roba22. Um, this is in response to my cue of the day yesterday, which was what's the biggest position battle that you're looking for? in spring practice and in the orange and white game. A uh, Robo 22 says, I agree with you on tackle and guards. Those are battles that need to be watched closely. I would add tight end needs to be added that discussion as well. Besides Warren, Jacob Warren, we have zero experience there and do not have the body types that we had the last two seasons in the offense. Uh, will that part of the offense look different because of that? Will the transfer coming in make a positive impact? Will the freshman coming in make an impact? Those are very good questions. Um, I think Ethan Davis is going to be an absolute stud in this offense here in a couple of years. He's the true freshman. Coming off an injury, missed the big portion of his senior season uh, with a labrum tear. Uh, but he has been active. He has been wearing a red jersey, but he's been uh, you know, a nice surprise so far in, in spring practice. Um, I think McAllen Castles is getting just a, a really, really um, a crash course in this offense. He's been active in the passing games and the scrimmages. Uh, the physicality for he and Davis has been tested in line, tied in H-back situations, and they've done well so far. But you're right. Um, outside of Warren, zero experience in this offense. Um, and that is that is a huge question mark. So I agree with you. Uh, you guys know how highly I think of the tight end position in this offense for sure. So uh, Robo22, appreciate your uh, your concern and your your questions there. All right. Um S Scrub 1999 says, Hey Eric, after multiple years of no depth at running back, do you believe Tennessee has the most depth and or experience coming back at running back in 2023 for the SEC? All right, that's a good question. Now, I'm not going to act like I know the rosters of every single Southeastern Conference football program outside of Tennessee. I know Tennessee's roster front and back. I can do it in my sleep, right? That's my job. Um, I know players um, for other SEC programs for sure. You know, Kentucky for the longest time, with Smoke and C-Rod, had such a great dynamic one-two punch at running back. Those guys are gone now. And really, Kentucky didn't run the football well last year at all with some injuries to those guys. Uh, but I would have said Kentucky for the longest time in terms of overall depth of the position. Now, I'm not sure about depth of the position for other teams, but you know, Quinshawn Junkins coming back for Ole Miss, he was an absolute stud as a true freshman last year, first-team All-SEC honors. Um, he's coming back and he's playing. He's a stud, right? Uh, you go down and look at Arkansas and what they have with Raheem Sanders. I believe he was a sophomore last year. Really talented running back coming back and, of course, is a guy that can do some things. You know, Georgia always has, you know, three or four quality running backs. And I would probably have to say Georgia, from a depth perspective, might might be the leader there. Um, not sure what Alabama has in the backfield. Jameer Gibbs is gone, of course. That was patchwork. It you know, came over and did a nice job. But when you look at Tennessee in terms of what it has, I mean, Jabari Small played a ton. Jalen Wright played a ton. Dylan Sampson played a lot last year. Um, and, and then now you have some of these young guys coming up and, and trying to vie for playing time as well. Um, for, from an overall depth, you love where Tennessee's at. I don't know if it's got the most depth. Um, you know, Tennessee, for, uh, for a lot of it, you know, it's it's – They've got the same body type at running back, right? And and you don't you're not falling in love with that, but that's why you hope Cam Selden can blossom in this offense, right? 
Um, and, and those guys have done a nice job of adding the armor, you know, Jabari Small and Jalen Wright over the years, but um, a lot of the same body tops in the system. So, but anyway, uh, Tennessee's got a lot of options. Tennessee's got depth. You feel really, really good about that for sure. Um, I would highlight those two guys I just mentioned from Ole Miss and Arkansas. Uh, but as far as depth, I don't know. I mean, that's that's a that's a off season topic I need to dive into and look at the rosters and all that. But if you're Tennessee, you like where you are for sure. All right, let's head on over to my Twitter account, the DMs, where you guys can send me all those questions each and every week. What up, Ross? First, Ross says. Um, with the kid from Colorado being so highly rated within the state, how hard do you think Dion will push to keep him at home? Great question, and I think he absolutely will, right? Um, he's one of the best players in the state of Colorado. There's not a whole lot of great players from Colorado, so you would think that Deion Sanders is going to try to keep him you know, at home big time. And I also think that this kid's recruitment is going to really – he's going to be getting a ton of calls over the, uh, over the offseason in the summer – He's going to be getting a ton of calls and visit opportunities uh, in, in the fall. Um, I think his recruitment is going to take off. I really, really do. So, again, it, it's never over until you sign that national letter of intent, you know, for sure. And so, But it's always good to get those guys in the boat early. Uh, but to answer your question, Dion continuing to go after him, making him a strong push to stay home, absolutely, I do anticipate that happening 100%. Uh, let's go to Braden. Braden says... Brayton sent in two things, and the first one really is a great discussion that I would like to do at some point this spring or this summer, but it's um, it's going to be one of those things where I have to put a lot of research into it. Uh, but great question. In the modern era of stars and rankings, what Tennessee recruiting class has had the biggest impact on Tennessee over the years? I'll tell you what recruiting class didn't. The 2019 recruiting class that was like top six or top seven in the country. Remember that was... Eric Gray, that was Henry Tuoltuo, that was that was all those guys, right? That was Covarage Crouch. None of those guys are here anymore. Uh, so, you know, inversely, the the the, t the class that didn't have an impact was that class. Uh, but great question. I would love to go back through and kind of look at the recent classes over the last ten, maybe maybe fifteen years. I think that'd be a really really good kind of you know gauge points uh, in terms of recruiting services and all that and i would love to do a segment on that or a show on that in the coming weeks great question i'll save that one but another one you asked given the switching tackle positions on the offensive line is like learning to walk again do you trust uh jeremiah uh jj crawford or mincy to make that jump to the other side Good question. Um, we've seen Crawford play right tackle before. Remember, he started the Music City Bowl a couple of years ago, and he he came in during the 2021 season uh, over there on the right side a couple of times. Um, we've never seen Gerald Mincy. We've never seen Gerald Mincy play on the right side. I don't know if he's ever played on the right side. But you're right. It's it's a big time adjustment. You 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 simply have to do the opposite of everything. Your stance is different. Your hand that you put down in the dirt is different. Your drops are different on that side of the football. So I feel like it's one of those things to where once you get it, it's not that big of a deal, but you do something so many times on on one side, it just becomes a muscle memory for you. So a lot of times it's kind of hard to switch that. But hey, Darnell Wright did it. And not everybody's Darnell Wright. I understand Darnell Wright's going to be a top 20 pick in the NFL draft. And I'm not trying to say these guys are Darnell Wright, but for the longest time, you know, Darnell Wright was just surviving. And then he played pretty well as a junior switching to left tackle, right? And then it's like, well, why, why do you want to mess with that? He did so well over that left tackle, switch back to his home side of the right side, and now it's going to be one of the top NFL draft picks. So um, I do trust those guys. I trust their teacher in Glenn Ellerby. I think he's um, he's got some work to do in recruiting, I feel like. But in terms of being a coach and developing um, and, and finding how to connect to his players, I like Glenn Ellerby. So to answer your question, yeah, I, I, I do trust that. It's a process, but I think once you get it, um, it's, it's really nothing for you to be able to flip flop back and forth. Um, let's go to, we just had Braden there. Let's go to Willie the Kid. Willie the Kid says, this is just for fun and hypothetically speaking, if you could take one offensive and one defensive player from any past team to help compete for a championship this season, who would it be? Mine would be Eric Berry and Robert Meacham. Really, really good uh, picks there. For so long, before Hinton Hooker, it was always like, well, you've got a lot of the pieces, you just need a quarterback. So the easy answer was like, oh, we'll go get Peyton Manning or Josh Dobbs or you know Heath Shuler or just a quarterback of old, right, to come and add to this team. I think I think Josh Dobbs would be great in this offense. I do. Um, Hinton Hooker, I mean, hell, you can maybe say Hinton Hooker right now again, right, because he was so good for you. 
Um, I think Joe knows this system well, and I think Joe's going to be okay. I don't think Joe's going to be the reason Tennessee um, is either good or – well, I'll take that back. If Tennessee's great next year, it'll be because you had great quarterback play. I don't think Joe Milton's going to be horrible next year. I don't. Um, I think he can be bad at times, but I don't think that he's going to be a reason why Tennessee – wouldn't be good. So um, I would probably say knowing the struggles Tennessee has in the secondary, guys like Eric Berry at safety, guys like Jason Allen, either safety or corner, guys like John Henderson up front. You talk about trying to get a four-man pass rush. If you can get that type of pressure from the inside, who John Henderson would be great to add to this defensive line and with Rodney Gardner. Daryl Taylor would be a nice add because Tennessee needs a Leo but again, it's it's hard to argue. I mean, I, I might have to go with you as well, Eric Berry. Uh, it's <laughs> you know, you there's not many more in terms of college defensive backs you could do better than Eric Berry. So I would go with Eric Berry. And then on offense, um, I didn't go back too far, but I tried to think again positions of need for Tennessee. I think Tennessee can do well with Brew McCoy, Dante Thornton, Ramel Keaton, and Squirrel White. I think Tennessee can do well in the system with that group of wide receivers. So, like, I hear you with Robert Meacham or with a Justin Hunter or, you know, with another really, really good wide receiver of, of old. But I think those are fine. Um, so I kind of look at biggest need. You know, quarterback, I've already addressed that. I think you roll with – I mean, of course you'll take Hooker or Peyton or any – of course you do that. But I think in order to help this offense out the most, I think Milton is fine. You look at offensive line – you need an offensive tackle, and you need an offensive guard. Juwan James would be really good in this offense. Um, I think Aaron Sears would be really good in the interior of this offense. I do. And then splashy playmakers. Boy, it'd be fun to see Cordero Patterson line up in the backfield of this offense and or Alvin Kamara line up in the backfield in this offense. You love where you are running back in terms of depth, but – Talk about an all pros, Cordero Patterson and Alvin Kamara. That'd be a whole lot of fun. And then, hey, you know, with Cam Selden, let, let Cordero Patterson do some things out there. Put him out of wide receiver. Put him in the backfield. I think that would be um, a whole lot of fun. All right. So we got one more. One more we're going to go to. And it is from our guy, Bruce on the loose. And he just simply says, Hey, what's the most important thing to be looking for in the Orange and White game? For example, is it the quarterback play or is it defensive play? Good question. Because again, it's a double edged sword in terms of what you're looking for in a spring game. You would love for your quarterback to go out there and throw for 400 yards. He won't play enough to do that. But you'd love for your quarterback to go out there and throw for 400 yards and four touchdowns. But if he does that, that means, gosh, that secondary is pathetic. You would love for a running back to go out there and break off some big-time runs. But then it's like, oh, man, that rush defense, gap integrity, that's bad. You would love for a defensive lineman to go out there and get you two sacks, three sacks, and you're like, man, that offensive line protection is tough. So, again, as a head coach – and as a media member kind of covering this team, it's like, <laughs> if you have somebody excel, that means you're doing it against your defense. Um, but here's what I'll go with this. I'll say, look for pass rush, specifically on the edge. You know, Roman Harrison, James Pierce, Joshua Josephs, uh, Caleb Herring probably won't play, but Caleb Herring, if, if he was out there. Look for those Leos. Look for that defensive line pass rush um, because you want to see who's doing it because Tennessee needs it in the fall, but also... You want to see which tackle and or guard combination they're beating because Tennessee needs a new tackle and a new guard. If you've got Josh, if you got James Pierce out there and he's beaten JJ Crawford consistently, you know, at least I know like, wow, JJ Crawford didn't have a very good uh, orange and white game and James Pierce is wearing him out. Or if you see JJ Crawford, just putting James Pierce in the dirt or Joshua Josephs in the dirt. I mean, that, that's a good sign. You can say, oh, well, JJ Crawford had a really good spring game. Maybe he'll win that right tackle spot. That's kind of where I would look because you want to see pass rush, but also if you get that pass rush, you want to see who they're beating because Tennessee needs a new tackle and a new guard. All right. Appreciate you guys as always for those Twitter Tuesday questions. When we come back, had a chance to catch up and watch on the clock featuring Hendon Hooker. If you have no clue what I'm talking about, stay tuned. If you haven't, if you know what I'm talking about and you haven't seen it yet, you might want to tune out because some spoilers ahead. That's coming up next here on Lockdown Balls. All right, guys, welcome back into it. A final segment of your Tuesday Locked On Vols. I'm Eric Kane. Appreciate you guys sitting in those Twitter Tuesday questions uh, that we got to in segment number two. Uh, to conclude this show, going to be a little shorter, a little briefer. I went a little overboard on those Twitter Tuesday questions. Um, on the Clock debuted last night on ESPN2. It's available right now on your ESPN Plus platforms. Um, but the episode regarding Hendon Hooker aired last night. Um 
if you're unfamiliar with on the clock is it's an it's a uh you know it's a four-part series espn plus original series uh, produced by omaha productions and it follows four quarterbacks through their 2022 season in college nfl combine pro days and ultimately up into the nfl draft the four quarterbacks uh were that feature were tennessee's hendon hooker alabama's bryce young kentucky's will levis and florida's anthony richardson last night they debuted the series with a two-parter at eight o'clock it was bryce young at 8 30 it was hendon hooker next week i believe on monday night is is will levis and then the following week the monday before the draft i believe is anthony richardson not sure about the actually i have those times uh, i wrote a i wrote a review for it up at volquest.com if you want to go check that out and that's essentially kind of what i'm i'm verbally doing here in this segment um, but it's really neat you know cj Stroud was not involved in this which is unfortunate because he might be the number one overall draft pick but i mean you talk about four quarterbacks bet four of college football's best in 2022 at least two of which bryce young and, and hendon hooker and then, of course, you have Will Levis and Anthony Richardson in there that were nowhere close to being the best of the best in college football, but are going to be top 10 or top 15 draft picks. Um, and they're going to be faces of franchises, right? Just because of, you know, testing well and body types and the potential. So anyway, um, you know, follow those four guys. And and um, it's an Omaha production, uh, production, right? And so it's Archie Manning, Peyton Manning, and Eli Manning. And I'm um, watching the episode on Hendon Hooker. I was sent a copy of it and asked to do a review for it over the weekend as kind of to try to, um, you know, amp up, you know, viewership for it on Monday night. So I watched it over the weekend, wrote a review. I put a review out there at VolQuest.com uh, Monday morning. And then, you know, some people might have read it and then, you know, decided to tune in and watch it for themselves. I'm going to give you some of my thoughts on what I thought of the the Hendon Hooker episode that was that aired officially on ESPN2 last night. Um it was really, really well produced. Uh, did a great job of kind of the timeline, opening up and like you know with with a you know shot from May of this past year, showing Hendon Hooker as a camp counselor at the Manning Passing Academy, showing him throughout the season, you know, big wins over Florida, big wins over Alabama, his senior day against Missouri, his injury against South Carolina, a little bit of his rehab, all that type of stuff. Did a great job of kind of detailing that timeline. Um, I will say this, there wasn't a whole lot of Hendon Hooker during the draft process a part of this. And I think a lot to do with that was because of the injury, right? I mean, Hendon, sure, he went to the combine, he went to the pro day, he went to the senior bowl, and he met, and he watched film, and he talked, and, and did a great job and all that, but he didn't throw, he didn't work out. And I'm sure the other episodes, you know, with Young, Richardson, and Levis will have a whole lot of their physical working out you know prior to the nfl draft and i think that's where this episode probably differed the most uh but you know with hendon did a great job of, of detailing his year and, and more about you know hendon hooker the person more 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 even than the quarterback it's just kind of like it's hard to find anybody that can't root for hendon hooker i don't care what colors you're, you're repping on saturdays right you just want to root for hendon hooker because he's a good dude. Um, I now understand good dudes don't get drafted all the time, but you know, luckily for Hooker, he can also play some football. And you know, Eli and Peyton and Archie kind of broke down, watched some film of that. Um, one thing I really liked from Peyton while watching the film was, you know, look at Hooker's eyes. Uh, it might be one of his biggest weapons, more so than his arm, more so than his decision making, more so than his escapability. It's those eyes to look off defenders and then scan the field and go throw it somewhere else. He said that will 100% translate to the NFL. If you can't look defenders off, you can't play on Sundays. And uh, he was really praising Hendon Hooker's eyes while watching the tape. And so I thought that was funny. Um, or I thought that was good. Speaking of funny, you know, with any Manning led production, there's going to be you know some hu humor in there. And a lot of people think it gets old and everything, but I, to me, it doesn't. I think it's funny. I mean, I, I'm a big Manning fan. Peyton, Eli, Archie, I love that family, as do a lot of you guys. Um, anything from Omaha Productions, you know, Peyton's places, Eli's places, all that type of stuff, it's funny. Um, Archie and Eli consistently slam Peyton throughout this episode about, oh, we finally have a Tennessee quarterback good enough to be a counselor at our camp. Oh, we finally have a Tennessee quarterback good enough to – we can roll the tape and talk about him in terms of a draft prospect. Uh, Peyton, who who was that quarterback for Tennessee that that beat Florida this year? I'm just asking because you know, you could never beat Florida, but but they had a guy this year, Hendon Hooker, right? Oh yeah, that's it. But you could never beat Florida, but Hendon Hooker could beat Florida. You know that type of humor. Um, Peyton, you know, decked out in orange, head to toe, consistently throughout this episode. It was funny to me. It didn't get lost. Uh, it was uh, it wasn't over the top. I thought it was funny. Um, did a good job of kind of detailing his parents' involvement and showing showing clips of them throughout, especially at the the Missouri 
uh, game this past year because that was the senior night for Hendon Hooker. Did a nice job of, of you know, cherry picking quotes over the past two years from Josh Heupel and Hendon Hooker and in press conference settings that you know myself we go sit in and we talk and take notes and and you know videos and all that and you know took and and kind of fed those those certain clips into the storyline of what they were talking about. I thought that was you know neatly done. Obviously, you had highlights from Hendon Hooker from you know various telecasts, whether it be CBS, um, ESPN, SEC Network, and and they did a nice job of dubbing some of the Vol Radio Network calls over the top of it from a production nerdy standpoint. I love that. I thought it was neat. So uh, it was good. Um, you know, is this the best thing I've ever seen in my life? No, but um, as a you know from a Tennessee perspective. I think Vol fans will love it. I think if you watched it last night, you loved it. And uh, I meant to say this at the beginning of the, of the segment, but, you know, uh, spoilers. <laughs> if, if you haven't seen it yet and want to see it, spoilers, turn away. But you got to get back and listen to all 30 minutes of tomorrow's episode. i got to get that time spent listening uh, numbers back up there to help the algorithms. But um, spoilers, spoilers, if you haven't seen it yet. And I kind of I, I mentioned it at the end of segment two, so I don't feel too bad. But it was good stuff. It was really good stuff. It was a good, easy watch. And I encourage all you guys to go check it out if you're a fan of Hendon Hooker. Uh, Bryce Young's was the episode right before Hooker's yesterday. And then, like I said, I think Levis is next week. And I think Richardson is, is two weeks after. So if you want to go watch it, go check it out. It's streaming on um, ESPN Plus right now. Um, the, the two episodes that aired last night. So, you know, they'll air on ESPN two and then they'll stream on ESPN plus after their, their air debut. And so that's where you can find the Hendon hooker one. If you don't have time to it, go to volquest.com, read my review of it. Uh, it should still be up there somewhere. So appreciate you guys as always for tuning in to locked on balls, making this your first listen each and every day coming up tomorrow. We hope to catch up with Josh Ward for a little Ward Wednesday action. We will continue to break down and preview Everything leading up to the orange and white game coming up on Saturday, and we'll have all that coverage right here on Locked On Balls. Guys, as always, thank you so much. Same time, same place. We'll do it again tomorrow. This is Locked On Balls.